give you a lot of details now, and we will see over the presentation what this is going to be about. Okay? But I try to put this title, uh, How to Run Very Development Companies on a Single System Without Dying in the Attempt, to make it a little bit more mysterious and not uh, give like a, this is going to be this framework or that technology or that other thing. So this is not going to be about technology. We are not going to see any line of code, but one line of code. Um, and the goal of this presentation is that after you listen what I'm going to explain, um, you get a different perspective from software architecture as a whole. Okay? So we are in a Java conference, but I'm not going to talk about Java, but rather about architecture. Okay? Um, I'm Albert Margarit. I work at NetSuite. I'm a software development manager. Uh, I work with this great team, and you can find me over there. We are in Barcelona, located in Plaza Catalunya. Um, and yeah, that's my Twitter in case you want to reach out after the, the presentation. So, what is this presentation about? Okay, so as you can see, I'm, I'm giving you already some hints about what this is going to be about. So, we can see some computers, some clouds, something like that. So, we are going to talk about uh, multi tenancy. Okay, multi tenancy is a type of software architecture. Um, that it's been there for many years, so it's not. I'm not coming here with something new, but maybe there are so many things about this architecture that seem obvious that uh, are not so obvious. Okay, and, and the goal of this presentation is to discover all all these challenges and all these benefits of a multi-tenant architecture. And maybe after the presentation, you will see uh, your application from another perspective. Okay. You may be wondering why I put these guys. Do you know who these guys are? The young ones. Uh, it's a TV series from UK, yeah, from the 80s, I think. So um, these guys are sharing a flat somewhere in London, I, I guess. And to me, multi-tenancy and, and uh, multi-tenant architecture is very similar to sharing a flat. Right? So you get together with a bunch of folks. Um, you want to save some money, so you rent the flat all together. Um, you're sharing the kitchen, you're sharing the bathroom, you're sharing the living room. But the important thing is that you still want your privacy. So you get your room, you get your space in the kitchen. So at the end of the month, it's much more efficient in terms of money. You don't spend as you were paying for your electricity, internet, uh, energy, heating. But you still get the benefits of having your private space with your private space in the kitchen to uh, store your stuff, okay? So that's my analogy of multi-tenancy, a multi-tenant architecture, and how these guys are sharing a flat to uh, save some money at the end of the month, okay? See, that one, to make this very boring, and multi-tenancy, and explain you all the benefits and all the challenges. So we will do the story. So this is a story of a crazy architecture, and this could be you guys uh, playing that story. So this is Maria, uh, our crazy ID entrepreneur. And here we have Mark, our keep it simple software engineer. So he's very pragmatic. Uh, he gets shit done, you know, but always being very pragmatic, not, you know, going over the clouds. Uh, by the way, these are uh, two of my colleagues. Uh, that's um, so Maria and Mark have one customer. They finished university. I don't know which university, maybe this one. Uh, they decided to start their own business. Some of us do this, uh, some of us don't. But uh, they went and said, look, I know a guys from my town, from Barcelona, that they sell uh, you know, hockey stuff. Um, so why don't we ask them to build a website for them? You know? And the deal, they got the deal. So they built this great website for them. So selling hockey stuff through an e-commerce. And they didn't use Magento or anything like that. They, you know, they were hardcore developers just uh, finishing university. So they, they, they created this website, okay? They were doing great. They were selling a lot of stuff. Uh, BarcelonaHockeyShop.com was talking very well about them. So eventually, they got a second customer, SoccerBalls.com, okay? And wow, that was great, you know? A small startup, getting customers, um, that's perfect, you know, but but now 
they faced a challenge. Um, so that was the moment where they had to think about architecture. And they said, okay, so what do we do? We have a system now, and we are planning to have another customer. So Maria, the crazy entrepreneur, asked Mark, like, what can we do now? Which, which is the right way to do this in terms of architecture? Okay, so Mark thought about it and came up with four solutions. Okay. So Mark said, we have four solutions, starting from very fearful, so very conservative, to the crazy idea. By the way, these are not types of architecture, okay? This is just the names that I put to make it a little more fun. So, let's start from the first one. So, Mark said, look, Maria, I think we got a new customer. We already have our Git repo. We have our styles for Barcelona uh, hockey shop.com. And we have our, uh, our infrastructure for them. So, why don't we just replicate the same we change the CSS, we change the JavaScript, we make the look and feel look like um, like uh, the new customer wants. We build it, we deploy the infrastructure, that's it, end of story. No, no issues, right? I mean, that's the obvious one. Um, but he went a little bit further and said, well, maybe we can just have one code base. Keep in mind that here we are maintaining two code bases. So we have one code base with customizations for one customer, another code base with customizations for another customer. So he said, yeah, this doesn't sound like the right thing to do. So why don't we unify the code base, and then we build some uh, customization capabilities on top, and then we can store like the GSS, uh, GS files and CSS in the database somewhere else. So we store customization as part of our system, so we don't need to maintain two systems. So we can code in one code piece, okay? And he said, yes, yeah, still I want two separate infrastructure. I mean, come on, I don't want to mix both of them, okay? He went a little bit more and more and said, well, single code base, customizations, single service, but still two separate databases, come on. We don't want to mess the data of two customers in the same database, you know? Uh, and that was like the fearless, like that, that was already going a little bit to the extreme. And then, you know, he was on that day that we have sometimes that we start thinking and we cannot stop. And then he said, well, I have a crazy idea. Single code base, uh, customization supported, so I can customize my system. And I'm going to use the same application service and the same database. So I and we will have data from the two customers on the same place. This guy is very pragmatic, remember, keep it simple. Okay, so obviously his approach, preferred approach was, was this one. However, Maria was a crazy entrepreneur and saw in this architecture a crazy opportunity. So by the architectural decision that she was making, she saw an opportunity for a business model, okay? So yeah, she just went for the crazy one. And Mark was like, what the fuck? Like, come on, are you serious? Like. That doesn't make any sense. Like, uh, okay, I'm gonna explain you. Explain you why. Like, I will need to rebuild the application. I will need to start writing new stuff in the application in order to support that. Like, I need to maintain customizations of both customers. Uh, my application should be agnostic of which customer is running on, right? That still should offer all the customization capabilities. This is so complex. I mean, I'm a good developer. But I don't even know if I'm able to tackle this, this challenge, you know? Um, and he was, what the fuck? Like, how are we going to make the data secure? Like, we have data from two customers in one database. We have to think about data leakage. We have to think about uh, all that stuff, you know? So it doesn't make any sense. And again, customizability is really tough, OK? And yeah, he was like, does that mean that we need to upgrade everybody at the same time? Like, will they want that? at all. So yeah, he wasn't seeing really the benefits. But you know, Maria was really convincing him and said, Mark, let's do it. Uh, this will pay off. Okay, so Mark, okay. Now is the boss. So what, what is he gonna say? So yeah, they made it and they fired uh, Mark. No, I'm kidding. Uh, this is a new this is a new customer. Uh, so 
they made the application and they even got a third of customer. Okay, so I mean it seemed to be paying off, you know. But they have so many challenges. Okay. First challenge, performance. So there was a crazy day during that period where <laughs> soccer balls uh, sold a lot of balls because it was the International Day of Soccer Balls. I don't know if you know about that day. <laughs> Um, so they had a huge uh, spike on sales, so all the resources of the server were basically going to the soccerball.com. So the other two customers were suffering to get their order through because basically the, the sites were unresponsive. So the orders took seconds to be saved instead of uh, milliseconds. Okay. Customization. The first customer, uh, BarcelonaHockeyShop.com. So they were growing, they wanted to have a, uh, custom, customizable sticks, you know, so they, wanna, they wanted to sell sticks where you could go and say, I'm going to put this label here, and I want this shape, and I want this flex of the stick, you know, and they needed something like that, but obviously this was a closed solution, they didn't have the control of the code. So they had to call these guys and say, Maria, Maria, I really need this, and if you cannot provide this, I will need to, I will need to leave, I will need another platform. So Mark had to develop something very quickly, so these guys could adjust uh, this stick configurator at the top. Security. They had two issues, okay? So a hacker tried to attack the servers and get some data, and this data almost gets compromised. That means single database, all data of all customers being leaked to the outside, okay? So obviously when Maria called the customers and said, you know, I have to tell you that something happened, you don't need to worry, but I must tell you. So they almost left after, after knowing this, you know. And then the last one, so yeah, we all have CEOs that want to be close to the code and they sometimes apply some fixes just to be cool. So, you know, Maria was on one of those days that said, you know, I'm going to do some coding, I'm going to fix that bug that Mark is never fixing. She applied the fix, got it into production, boom. The site was down for two hours, okay? So all customers couldn't do anything. All customers, okay? So again, um, Mark told us, right? So the thing is that it was not that terrible. Okay, and that's what Maria is telling to Mark, like, yeah, you're very pragmatic, this could have been solved by having three different repositories, three different services, but come on, it's not that bad, let me explain what we achieved with this architecture. So we reduce the operational effort by a lot. I mean, we only need to maintain one single infrastructure instead of three uh, infrastructures. We have three customers. Imagine if we are growing and we are getting more and more customers, okay? We need only to maintain one, one version, so that's, that's a good thing. And obviously, all the upgrades, the release management, that's pretty easy. We have one system, one server, or we can, we can have multiple servers. We can do load balancing, whatever. But we are maintaining one system where an upgrade is just one upgrade. It's not an upgrade for each customer, okay? They reduce the cost. I mean, they are not paying as many licenses as they would pay if they would have different infrastructures. They are really being effective with their, with their hardware, okay? They are taking one box, and making sure that it's, you know, working at full speed for these customers. They can scale. Any customer can come today and say, I want to sign up. And the customer can sign up immediately. Okay, they don't need to say, yeah, hold on. I'm going to go over there and get that box and put it for you. You know, I'm going to pull out the code there. So it's much, much easier. And that's, the, that's one of the key points as well. They can be smart about the data. They have the data in one place. So they can, they can know trends. They can know trends from multiple customers. They can say, oh, let's see how we're doing in sales, our customers all together. And we can identify, for example, when there are spikes in sales. Oh, you see that Black Friday? It got crazy. You know, we did so many transactions across all our customers. They can also discover how tenants are using the application. They can know who is using that feature, who is using that other thing, who is using that field that we put out there, you know? And obviously they can monitor the whole infrastructure to know 
and to detect failures and performance trends. Okay. The last thing is that our customers, in fact, they love the architecture. Okay. And the idea is that they get upgrades with no effort, so they don't need to be calling and hey, can you please upgrade or can you please take care of that bug or just for me. They're getting upgrades every every time that we decide uh, for free, kind of. Okay. They don't have to worry about IT and security, and that's that's not related to multi-tenancy. You can still have a software as a service uh, system that is not designed with uh, multi-tenancy. But obviously, if you make it multi-tenant, it's going to be much easier to respect uh, that sentence. They only pay for what they use, and they don't pay for licenses. So it's not that I want to use that service, and I'm going to pay you that much, you're going to give me this, the license, I'm going to install this in my server, and then uh, that's it, I'm going to maintain the whole thing. No, they just pay for what they use. Our business model is just for that, okay? And what I said before, our uh, new customers can just go to a website, say, I want to use this uh, super cool shop.com, uh, I want to create my own, and that's it. Just a uh, form, done. And I can have my website that I can start customizing. By the way, let's see if you, at lunchtime, who recognizes this guy uh, in the audience. All right, uh, so how did these guys do it? Okay, this is a lot of talking, a lot of benefits, challenges, but we are not really getting into the details of how these guys did the multi tenant architecture, okay? So, the first thing when we are building a multi tenant architecture is that we cannot break any these rules, and these are very simple. So, same application code, um, same data storage, same OS, same hardware, okay? If we start making some exceptions, well, for this customer, why don't we use that other thing that they want? Sure, do it now. You will suffer about it later, okay? Because that works for 10, for 15 customers. If you wanna get to the 30,000 that we were mentioning before and you are starting making exceptions, like, okay, yeah, this guy doesn't want uh, Oracle, I don't know why, but uh, wants uh, MySQL, sure. When you have 30,000 and you have a few of those, it's going to be a nightmare, okay? The second most important rule, that's the line, one line of code that I was mentioning. This is completely forbidden. So if you design a multi-tenant system, you cannot start doing, oh, I just got a huge bug for this customer, but it, I cannot replicate that in the other customer. Yeah, just put this, you know. If it's this customer, then do that other thing. That's a common thing in any software as a service and multi-tenant application. And you should avoid that. You should use um, flags, features instead. All the bugs that you find should become a feature, kind of. You, may, you, you have to make sure that those get transformed into something that you can explain. And it's not just, yeah, if customer this, it's that. No, it's what does that mean? How can you explain that to somebody? If I get another customer that has the same problem, can I use the same feature? Should I extend it? Should I make this a more robust feature that I can say, well, you are going to use this feature this way, you are going to use that other feature that other way. But never ever do this, okay? Think about security, and this is really important. I mean, we, you're going to create a service, um, you're going to hold all the data. You have, the first concern that you are going to get from your customers is, well, this is not secure. I want my data in my place. I, or I don't want to share my data storage with somebody else. What if my data gets leaked to, you know, to another company? So this is a very weak argument for software as a service. So security is really important. But on the other hand, <coughs> if you are the company responsible for security, you can make sure that your security is the, is the best. I mean, you can make sure that your security would, is better than what your customer would do in terms of security. Right, so you have to pay a lot of attention. You have to design your system to automatically generate database queries that always go to specifically to the tenant data. So all the data should be stamped with a tenant ID. So whatever you store, this customer belongs to this tenant. This other customer belongs to that other tenant. This transaction belongs to this tenant. And then every query that you generate should be automatically filtering for that tenant, okay? Obviously, all the layers of your application should know that it's a multi-tenant solution. So it's not that you're going to design something that is 
for multi-tenancy and then other layers that, yeah, I don't know about customers or I don't know what this is about. So you have to think about multi-tenancy from top <coughs> to bottom, okay? And I don't know if you know the OWAS uh, recommendations. These are like the 10 top uh, attacks every year, security attacks. So you have to be really taking care of this and making sure that your application is fulfilling all this, okay? And that involves training to all your employees, that involves uh, checks to make sure that the application is not falling in any, any of these. This is, what, this is when it gets really interesting. So your system must be customizable, okay? That, I mean, there's no way you can build a multi-tenant solution and you're gonna be so smart about putting the right features that everybody will like. Sorry, but that's not gonna happen. So you have to put flexibility in your system. So any customer can go and say, well, I'm gonna extend this here, I'm gonna extend that other thing there, and stuff like that. And that involves everything, from branding, that's the example that we saw before, CSS, JavaScript, stuff like that, workflows. So when I create my order, I wanna authorize the credit card before I save, instead of saving and then authorizing, for example. You should be able to, uh, the customer should be able to customize that. You have to allow customers to put their own business logic. Maybe when they save that order, they wanna call a web service and do some crazy stuff. And you cannot provide that. You cannot provide all the needs for all your customers. So you should, you should have some sort of platform where your customers can build their own stuff on top of your system. Obviously, you should be able to extend the data model. So maybe your order, uh, wants to know about VIP customers, but I don't use VIP customers, or I don't use special items, or I don't have any, any of those data model extensions that you use. When I say you, you are a customer, and I say me as another customer. So you be able to go to the system and say, I wanna put this extra piece of model here, and I wanna put this extra piece of business logic. And for that, most likely you're gonna need a, a programming language, okay? A programming language that you open where your customers can write their stuff and where your system is gonna take what your customers wrote and it's gonna run it on the server, okay? So in order to do that, you should probably pick a, a good, well-known programming language. It can be JavaScript. You can run JavaScript on server-side with Node, with Rhino, with many other tools. It can be C Sharp. And you can run Sandbox C Sharp in your server. It can be Java, Salesforce, that does Java, for example. NetSuite does JavaScript. I mean, there are many, many vendors doing that already. Um, important, you have to set clear boundaries between your code and the customization. You don't want data to be leaked. Imagine if you offer a customizable platform and then somebody finds a hole and says, wow, I can load all the data from that other customer from here. So it should be very clear. I mean, clear boundaries, clear sandboxes, you cannot play with uh, anything else than, than it's in the sandbox, okay? Um, another important fact is that if you put customizable features in your platform, you should offer a sandbox account. Your customers will need a way to try out what they are building. They cannot go to production and say, oh, let me try this new business logic. They will need some sort of infrastructure though where they can play with stuff, right? And obviously you need a community. If you're gonna put a programming language, you want your customers to be coding stuff in there, you will need some sort of community or ecosystem where customers can maybe share some of those, those customizations and stuff like that. Another very important topic, as we saw before as a challenge, performance really matters. So you have to set very clear uh, governance uh, policies. And that means you, as a customer, cannot do, for example, more than a thousand API calls uh, uh, every minute. And that's a policy. And I programmatically will check that in my system. Because if you do not respect that policy, my other customers are gonna suffer. So we have to be adding lots of those policies in our code. Also, if we allow customizations, we should put some workload quotas, kind of, so if you are gonna write a customization in my platform, I should be able to measure more or less how much you are consuming. For example, what we do at NetSuite, every single, we use JavaScript, 
So every single uh, line of code that the customer writes in the API has some unit of work. And that means doing this operation takes 10. Doing that other operation takes 20 because it's more expensive. Doing that other thing takes 50. And we say in a script, in what you are allowed to run now, we will let you use 200 units. Once you get over 200 units, bah, sorry, that's going to take a lot of time. Okay, so you have to start thinking about this, and it's not a, it's not an easy thing, right? That's what I mean about exceeding algorithms. Obviously, your system should scale horizontally. Okay, the fact that we are running on a single system doesn't mean that when we have peaks, we have to, you know, go horizontally scaling, and that should be elastic, right? We sh we don't need anybody to be there. Oh, I need more servers. Run, do it now. And. When you design your multi-tenant solution, think about this. If you have a problem, a disaster, you're fucked up. So make sure you get backups of every data that you have in your system and have a recovery plan. Make sure you tell to your customers, hey, if a disaster happens, don't worry. I got your data, but I have a plan, okay? Otherwise, they will not trust you. And these are about trust, because you are trusting me as a vendor to run all your system and store all your data. I know that some of you here um, may uh, have seen a lot of sessions about Docker and virtualization and I know that some of you may be thinking that's bullshit. That's bullshit. Come on. In the first part when Mark and Maria were designing the application and they had the single source code and then they have the infrastructure, come on, just virtualize the whole thing. You put a virtual instance for one customer, for another customer, and that's for free. And I will tell you, okay, <laughs> let's, let's think about it. So, multi-tenancy, virtualization, so cool. I mean, virtualization is required. I'm not saying not to virtualization. We need virtualization to scale in our system, in our multi-tenant system. But what I'm saying is, in this case, no virtualization for one instance of my service to one customer. Then another virtual instance for another customer. Because at the end, let's think about the 30,000 customers. If you have 30,000 customers and you have 30,000 instances for each customer, you still need, will need to upgrade 30,000 instances. If we can put that into a multi-tenant solution, probably for 30,000 customers, we will only need around 3,000 servers, instances. And I'm not making up these numbers. Salesforce, for example, has like 100,000 customers, and they are running all of that in like 6,000 servers. Imagine if they would use one image per customer, and then each customer would need to scale. They would have not a hundred thousand uh, instances, but probably many, many, many more, okay? So, complexity of operations is growing exponentially. As soon as we say one customer, one instance, sure, let's do it. You will see, maybe this, that other thing will happen. You're not gonna use your resources in the best way. And that's, I mean, virtualization is great, and you will need that, but it's not, it's not gonna be using it efficiently. It's gonna cost money, and your customers probably will, instead of waiting seconds to start their, their using the service, they will require maybe minutes because we will need to create a new uh, instance of virtualization. Blah, blah, blah. However, virtualization for multi-tenancy, why yes? I'm not saying that it's, you never must, uh, you never uh, should look at this uh, solution. Some, in some cases, when you have a legacy application, rewriting the whole application to be multi-tenant is a no-go. I mean, there is no way you can get your application with thousands of lines of code and then say, now we're going to make it multi-tenant and the database is going to be multi-tenant. That's not going to happen. So in those cases, multi-tenancy is still an option. But be aware that at some point, after you scale and you grow so much, it's going to start to be very painful. If you do a multi-tenant solution with a legacy system, sorry, if you do virtualization to become multi-tenant with a legacy system, 
you will reduce the cost as well, and you will reduce the risk, right? If uh, a CEO says, well, we are going to rewrite the whole application, and now it's going to be multi-tenant because we are going to save some money in hardware. Sure, the risk is huge, because that can go wrong. <coughs> and that's, I mean, that's in fact what's happening with many vendors that were operating for many years, for 20 years, and now these software as a service companies are growing and starting to get some traction and they say, well, we have to go to the service model as well. So what do we do? So they use virtualization. Um, but let's see, maybe it works, maybe it doesn't work. So going back to the story with Maria and Mark, so hopefully with that architectural decision, that seemed a very, very basic architectural decision, but in fact, that was a great opportunity to start a business model that could scale and that could uh, take advantage of optimized infrastructure. So 10 years later, hopefully we got those, these guys got these 30,000 customers. And before we go for lunch, here are some of the takeaways that I would like you to bring after this presentation, okay? So if you are gonna think about software as a service and multi-tenancy, do it early. It's not a decision that you can take at the end when you have your application built. So you have to do it from, from the very beginning. Every single line of code that you write on top is gonna, be, is gonna make it harder and harder to go back, okay? A multi-tenant solution is a cost-effective architecture. It's not, it's not the unique and ultimate architecture. Obviously, different applications have different architectures. But if you are thinking about a service, make sure you consider multi-tenancy to reduce the cost. Think about customizations, okay? There is no way you're gonna be able to put a service out there and say, yeah, I'm not thinking about customizations and that's gonna work. No way. So think about programming language, your ecosystem, how you're gonna deliver uh, a platform, how you're gonna make sure that your customers understand how they can code on top of that. Think about governance. As soon as you add customization, you have to think about governance and make sure you control every single of your tenants, of your customers, so they don't exceed what they are allowed to, okay? Security, that's uh, an obvious, and I'm, gonna, uh, I'm not gonna say much about security. And as the last one, consider virtualization as an alternative if you have already built a system that uh, you cannot just rewrite from today to tomorrow. And having said that, I expect a lot of questions from you guys. Thank you. Sure that you have through routing 
your instance in their hosting. So it's not it's multi-tenant from the outside. From the inside, it's not a multi-tenant architecture. It's still being single tenant architecture.
say that that's up uh, to your imagination. <laughs> uh, for example, uh, what we do at, at NetSuite, we, we do something similar to this with e-commerce and also with uh, ERP in the backend, but then our customers can use that infrastructure with all the uh, open points for customization to build crazy things. So maybe they use the, for example, we have customers that build their e-commerce site for selling to you know, consumers. And we also have in the US like uh, states that uh, uh, purchase stuff for the government, government offices through these e-commerce sites. So this is like B2B services. So it really depends on how you want to model that because since the platform is supposed to be so open for customizations, you can use it in your own way, I would say. We have, that's, uh, that's interesting because uh, at NetSuite, we, um, we allow users as well to create their own uh, REST applications or even to put HTML. I mean, they have, it's like a platform. So we have some users that build crazy stuff on top, like that we don't even know or don't even support, you know? Like, so you can create a game on top of that if you want. And this is, you know, there's a discussion about the mobile receiver of that 
that job is responsible to say, okay, I got this request for this tenant, so I'm going to go to this database where is the tenant uh, data is, and I'm going to run these queries, crazy queries that the tenant uh, defined in the platform, and I'm going to build these reports. So, um, it's always tenant specific, yes. So we, we do some, so cross tenant queries are, ex I mean, we only do that internally. We would never allow that externally, obviously. So we do that, uh, for example, to know usage, you know, feature usage, performance uh, metrics and stuff like that. All right, so I think I will let you guys go for lunch. And if you have any questions, please uh, 